Well, good morning, everyone. I call this meeting then to a board of work. I want to extend a special welcome to a group of new examiners who are attending today's meeting. Greg Marshall, where is Greg Marshall? Morning, Greg. Is the instructor of a new examiner step five class? I mean, it sounds like a dance routine. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> step five with seven federal examiners and six state examiners. Would you guys stand up? I want to see who you are. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Congratulations. Glad yeah. you're here. I'd also like to announce that the board voted this morning to add a fourth item to our um, previously announced agenda. This item concerns a proposed reduction in the share insurance fund normal operating level from 1.39 to 1.38. The first item on the agenda today is final report into a regulatory reform task force staff presenting Mike McKenna, General Counsel, Tom Zell, Staff Attorney, Office of the General Counsel. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Chairman Quarters, Board Member Metzger. It's really odd to be on this side of the table. Yeah. yeah <laughs> In March of 2017, uh, Chairman created the Regulatory Reform Task Force. He appointed myself, and I Director Larry Fazio, One's Director Scott Tushets Hunt, OCFO Deputy Director Eugene Notai Schneid, and the Chief Economist Ralph Monaco. We also added Tom Zells to do most of the real work. Our mission was to review all of NSRAID's regulations to see which ones could be updated, modified, or eliminated. We drafted a report that was issued by the NSRAID board in August of 2017 and it solicited comment from industry stakeholders. We prioritized our regulatory initiative into three tiers. The first tier, we emphasized regulations that would get the biggest bang for the buck in the shortest amount of time. We initially had 16 regulations in the first tier, and the NSRAE board has already completed 10 of those items. They include the corporate credit union rule, the emergency merger rule, securitization, the supervisory review committee rule, the appeals rule, the equity distribution rule, the capital planning and stress testing rule, the advertising rule, builder membership two, and RBC. The NSRAE board has also proposed another four rules Federal Credit Union Bylaws Rule, Loan Maturities Rule, the Appraisal Rule, the Fidelity Bond Rule. Hopefully in the next few months, the board will issue two other proposed rules on the Supervisory Committee and an ANPR and Executive Compensation. We will also be recommending some Tier 2 rules be moved up to Tier 1, and we hope to initiate those before <coughs> June of 2019. In this second and final report, we have moved a few items from Tier 2 to Tier 1, including a subordinated debt rule, formerly known as alternative capital, a CUSO proposal, and a proposal to make interest rate ceilings a floating rate. During the last 18 months, we have suspended the OGC's one-third review. In response to commenters and the initiation of this report, we will now commence with the one-third review starting in January of 2019 with the first third of NCRA's regulations. Of course, all of the task force recommendations require the NCRA board to take action on a particular recommendation. Just because we recommend something doesn't mean this or future boards will take action on it. Hopefully, though, the publication of this document will provide a roadmap to the industry and this agency in the continuation of regulatory reform. With that, Tom will now discuss the structure of the report and how we plan on keeping track of NCRA's progress in implementing the task force recommendations. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so as with regards to measuring uh, future progress, as proposed in the first report, the second report recommends that the NCUA measure the agency's progress as it advances through the regulatory reform agenda. More specifically, the report recommends that the NCUA publish on its website the outline of this report's refined blueprint subject to need needed future modifications to be updated every six months to monitor progress. This outline should document whether the agency has published any documents related to the individual recommendations, such as a proposed rule or a final rule, and whether any changes to the recommendation or refined blueprint timeline have been made. Uh, with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mai. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for all of your work. 
I mean, this is a example of I think regulatory transparency. So we 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 looked at a problem, a potential issue or a set of issues, and Mike and his team went through all of our regulations, and they went through them doing uh, and place them in these matrices with dealing with what's the easiest to accomplish and the biggest bang for the buck. And so we, we, we prioritize them so we could do the most good as quickly as possible. And we publish it all. We told a story. This is not a double top secret about what the NCUA board plans to do in the future. We're telling the credit union community. Not only are we telling the credit union community the first time we published this in the Federal Register, we actually asked for comments that the community can actually comment back to us about what, what we're doing. And we listened to those comments, and you know, the credit union community had some very good points. And so we reprioritized, as Mike said, moved some items from a bottom, from a lower tier to a higher tier, and proceeding to work through those. 10 out of 16, four more proposed, and the like. So, I mean, to me, this is exactly what federal bureaucracy, bureaucracy should be doing. They should not be steeped in mysticism at all. This is what we do. This is how we're going to do it. And we will respond to a crisis or an exigent circumstances as it arrives. But here's our roadmap. Here's our roadmap for 2019. Rick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have nothing to add, but I certainly agree. Uh, I move the board approve publication of the Regulatory Reform Task Force's second final report in the Federal Register as attached to the board action memorandum. I second the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Let the record show it passed two to zero. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the second item on our agenda is board briefing blockchain and distributed ledger technology staff presenting Scott Borger, senior economist, office of the chief economist, Rachel Ackman, uh, staff attorney, office of the general counsel, and Amanda Parkhill, policy division director, office of examination and insurance. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman McWatters, board member Metzger. We are here today to provide you an overview of blockchain and distributed ledger technology and discuss how these technologies might impact credit unions. In July 2018, Mr. Chairman, you created the Blockchain Working Group to build the agency's expertise and knowledge about these emerging technologies. You asked us to take a deeper look at the impact of cryptocurrencies and their underlying technologies on the credit union system. During the past five months, that is exactly what we've done. We brought together an NCUA working group with members from many NCUA offices. The group reached out to subject matter experts to learn more about the technology. We considered how technology fits into the broader set of innovations and financial services. We also began working toward a, developing a comprehensive framework for how to evaluate blockchain projects. Our presentation this morning provides an overview of cryptocurrencies, which is one prominent use of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. We considered how Bitcoin, the first and best known cryptocurrency, Ethereum, Ripple, and other tokens fit into the landscape of technological innovation in our current payment system. We will discuss how the technology works and hopefully provide some clarity around the opportunities and risks of the new technology. Let's begin with electronic transactions in our current payment system. For more than four decades, the ACH, or Automatic Clearinghouse Network, has been the primary method for financial institutions to conduct transactions electronically within the United States. The service provides an electronic record of each transaction and is more convenient for businesses and financial institutions than physical checks. Over the years, technology has improved, but the speed of financial transactions has, has remained the same. Technological advances have made it possible to provide consumers with faster payment services, giving rise to financial technologies or fintech companies like Venmo, a peer-to-peer -peer payment service. However, these peer-to-peer -peer services still use traditional financial networks to process payments. These peer-to-peer -peer services continue to connect customers through their financial institution, the trusted nodes of the ACH network. Bitcoin is among the most well-known example of a different approach to payment process. Using blockchain technologies, Bitcoin provides peer-to-peer -peer payments 
without the need for a trusted intermediary like credit unions and banks. In the new payment system, individual computers form a network. Each computer or node in the network holds the same copy of the digital ledger. Any copy of the ledger can verify ownership of the digital asset, but transfer of ownership is achieved when the nodes of the network reach a consensus that the new transaction is valid. Simply put, the nodes reach a consensus that the person making the transfer has the funds, in this case, Bitcoin. Let's consider the peer-to-peer -peer payments in the context of our payment system diagram. The unique digital asset can be transferred between two people without an intermediary. However, practically speaking, members of the public have no way to convert dollars into digital assets like Bitcoin. So software developers and entrepreneurs created marketplaces to exchange dollars for Bitcoin in digital wallets to provide customers with a convenient way to store their encryption keys that are needed to verify ownership. The entities that run these marketplaces, like Coinbase, are the new intermediaries in the digital ledger payment system. Since the introduction of the blockchain technology, thousands of projects have used the technology to lower the cost of verifying ownership, storing distributed data, or tracking information. Everything from tracking ownership in national land registries to tracking the history of the product in the food supply chain are now open to improvement through the use of the technology. As you can see, blockchain has the potential to change the way that we conduct some financial transactions. Blockchain takes the way the need to have a central authority maintain records of asset ownership. As we will talk about later, this comes with some downsides. The County Recorder of Deeds provides us a good analogy of how blockchain works. When I began working, I was a paralegal working on financial transactions for the city of Chicago's law department. On occasion, multi-million dollar building projects would require us to verify the ownership of a plot of land in the city. A lawyer would send me, send me down to the Cook County Recorder of Deeds to verify ownership. Ownership information, including liens on the property and when the ownership was transferred, was kept in thick, dusty books. I would go down there, find the right book, and blow off the dust and check the record. A distributed ledger can provide an equally definitive record of ownership. It is equivalent to having all the books at the County Recorder of Deeds office on each of the computers in the network. When a transaction occurs, all the books record the transaction at the same time, providing evidence of the transaction to whomever might want to verify the ownership at a later date. Let's walk through how the blockchain and distributed ledger works. First, to start a transaction, you need a digital address and some basic information. The information required for a transaction depends on the type of the blockchain. For tokens like Bitcoin, where the value is being transferred, the encryption information for the Bitcoin is provided. For blockchains that use smart contracts, then the information is based on the information required in the contract. Second, a block is created and stores the transaction information safely using a computer algorithm or hash function. The encrypted data includes information about the current transaction and the previous transactions to verify it is a valid transaction on the blockchain. Third, the block is then ready to be transmitted to the network for validation. The data are shared among the participating nodes, and the participants provide consensus by agreeing on the newest block added to the chain. Consensus is achieved by some form of voting among the participants and is predetermined in the protocol. The consensus mechanism is the heart of every digital ledger and is its most defining feature. Fourth, there are a variety of ways for the network to validate a transaction, but among them are proof of work and proof of stake methods. Proof of work requires those in the network to compete for the right to validate a transaction. For Bitcoin, these are the Bitcoin miners. The work is to add a number to the transaction information that solves a puzzle embedded in the Bitcoin computer program. The miner that solves the puzzle is given the right to validate the block and gets a small payment of Bitcoin for verifying a transaction. Proof of stake is an alternative method to validate a transaction. Participants with a demonstrated stake in the token system are the nodes in the network verifying the transactions. Fifth, the transact with the transaction validated, the block is added to the blockchain. The links between blocks prevent any block from being altered. In this way, each subsequent block strengthens the verification of the previous block and hence the entire blockchain. And sixth, the transaction is verified and executed. Evidence of ownership requires two encryption keys one public, one private. The public key is like a person's street address, and the private key is like a key to their mailbox. No person could verify the ownership of a digital asset without having 
the private encryption key. Therefore, the private key is as valuable as the digital asset itself, since anyone with that key could transfer its value to anyone else in the world. Potential widespread use of distributed ledger, ledgers and financial transactions brings both opportunities and risks. For example, among the early uses, Bitcoin provided its users with a way to avoid regulatory requirements, evade taxes, or conduct illicit transactions. This raised a number of concerns for regulators. As it became easier for software developers to create their own tokens, regulators became concerned that the funds raised by issuing tokens were not in compliance with securities laws. Consumer protections became more paramount as the number of tokens and the volatility of the value of these tokens increased, and as the general public relied on third parties to create digital wallets to hold their private keys. I will now turn to Rachel Ackman in NCUA's Office of General Counsel and a member of the Blockchain Working Group to discuss how blockchain projects might think about these regulatory concerns. Thanks, Scott. The NCUA's role is to safeguard the credit union system. It's from that perspective that our working group has begun to develop a framework that the NCUA could use when evaluating blockchain projects. We grouped our concerns into four categories. Let's quickly walk through some of the concerns the working group has in each category. First, the group has a number of questions related to blockchain projects and illicit payments. Has the project considered how it complies with the Bank Secrecy Act, money laundering, and know your customer regulations? Are there nodes in the payment system that don't comply with Bank Secrecy Act requirements, and are they being used for illicit payments? Some credit union projects are proposing permissioned ledgers, where each node in the network would be another credit union. Other credit union projects, however, might involve credit unions and banks as well as crypto exchanges. What safeguards will be in place to ensure these exchanges are not being used to launder money? Second, the working group has been looking at investor protection issues. Has the project considered how it will comply with regulations that protect investors? Does the blockchain protocol create a token that exhibits characteristics of a security? If so, then the token might be in violation of securities laws and could face enforcement actions by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Third, the working group has also begun looking into challenges around consumer protection. Has the project considered how it will comply with regulations that protect consumers? Do the transactions provide the consumer with adequate information to make informed decisions about risk? When fraud occurs, is there a way to make a victim a fraud whole? Or does the immutable nature of the blockchain make it impossible to reverse the fraudulent transaction? Finally, the group has been considering the broader issue of safety and soundness. For example, does the project use a third-party vendor and has the credit union conducted its due diligence on the firms providing the credit union with the service? There are many other operational and technical issues that could pose safety and soundness issues. It is a concern that regulators like the NCUA must continue to evaluate. Now I'll turn it back over to Scott. Thanks, Rachel. I want to take a moment to note that the agency is also working on emerging financial technologies more broadly. The FinTech Working Group, led by Amanda Parkhill, was created in August 2018 to address the agency's approach to artificial intelligence, non-traditional lending, and other technological innovations on the horizon. I'll turn it over to Amanda to preview the work being done by the FinTech Working Group. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> in addition to identifying the types of FinTech in the industry, the FinTech Working Group is also looking at what the NCUA can do to ensure credit unions are able to adapt and embrace <coughs> innovative financial technologies so that they can effectively compete in the changing financial services marketplace. We are looking at potential supervision and regulatory efforts and also developing a plan for providing industry outreach and soliciting stakeholder input. So um, look for additional information in the first quarter of 2019. Now I'll turn it back over to Scott. Thanks, Amanda. Over the next few months, the goal of the blockchain working group is to engage the industry and to learn how credit unions view and use these emerging financial technologies. The working group has created a dedicated email address, blockchain at ncua.gov, that we hope will be a conduit for interested members of the credit union community to let us know how they are using blockchain projects and to give us feedback on the role of the NCUA in safeguarding the financial system in the context of these emerging technologies. In summary, while financial innovation has always been with us, the accelerating pace of change that information technology has brought coupled with the widespread diffusion of computing power and the growing importance of networks is raising new challenges. The blockchain working group and the FinTech working group are working to understand the implications of these changes on the credit union system 
and the challenges they might raise in order to fulfill our mandate to maintain a safe and sound system of cooperative credit. We are happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys very much for your work. I know back in the beginning of the summer, I was, I was thinking about this issue. And blockchain is one of those terms, it's used so often now that if someone asks you about it, you immediately have to say, oh yeah, I, blockchain, sure, I understand that, I get that. Otherwise, you're going to appear clueless. Okay, well, that's not a really great way to learn. That's really not a great way to act as a regulator. So um, after talking with um, Mr. Metzger's office, we set up this working group to sort of be able to explain and help us understand how blockchain and this idea of a distributed ledger system could interface with the credit union community. And what's the future of this? If this is the greatest thing in the world and credit unions don't understand it and NCUA doesn't understand it, then that's a recipe for bad things happening in the future, okay? And there's an old saying, there's no deception like self-deception. So you have to admit what you don't really understand, you don't really get. So I set up the working group, found some really smart people who understand it, and they got to work and they produced this product. I wanted a briefing so no one thinks in the credit union community that NCUA is not paying attention to these issues. Um, as well as the fintech issue itself. So when you think about the NCUA budget, part of our budget is going to items like this, items that you as a member of the credit union community may not see an immediate return on, may not see, oh, I got this for that, but we're laying the foundation, we're building the foundation for a safe and sound credit union community as financial services evolve as I use blockchain technology and distributed ledger concepts. What all this means, we look back on this in 10 years, we're gonna have a much better picture of where we were headed. Right now, thanks to these guys and what they're doing, um, I think we are, we, are, we are ahead of the game. Mr. Metzger. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and this is important uh, because things are changing rapidly and it is going to have impacts uh, heretofore unknown, and so, um, you know, getting a, a greater background is really, really important. I know the SEC is dealing with this, uh, struggling with things, um, uh, particularly in the world of cryptocurrencies and looking at how some of these are being conveyed and deciding these really aren't currencies, these are securities, and of course we're in the business as well as the FDIC and others in insuring assets, but if they're not you know, uh, if certain things that might be considered aren't really considered currencies, they're not going to be insured. And, and so as the technology moves ahead, um, as well as our uh, responsibility and member credit unions' responsibilities are um, in things like bank secrecy and about anti-money laundering, that uh, trying to stay, if not ahead of the curve, certainly with the curve uh, as these things uh, evolve. So I uh, appreciate your work. Look forward to... Um, uh, ongoing dialogue of, uh, you know, how we move forward and with our sister agencies on this. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, the third item on the agenda is final rule, technical amendments to NCUA's regulation staff presenting Ben Litchfield, Staff Attorney, Office of General Counsel. Technical amendments. Wow. I'm on, I'm on the edge of my seat here, so. That's exciting stuff. Yeah, it is exciting stuff. Did we forget to don an I across the T? Or? Precisely that. Okay, is. okay, let's hear it. <laughs> so good morning, Chairman McWaters and Board Member Metzger. Um, I think it's important to note at the outset that even great Homer nods from time to time. Uh, so while we strive for perfection, we do forget to dot I's and cross T's occasionally, and so this final rule, in sum and substance, makes several changes to correct minor errors and inaccurate citations throughout the NCUA's regulations. We make general wording changes to conform to our style guide, and we fix some minor drafting mistakes 
particularly in the chartering manual where you'll notice things like a stray bullet point or something of that nature. The most important change that we make is that we change the description of the NCOA to reflect our reorganization. Recently, the board approved a broad reorganization to improve efficiency at the agency, and we make this rule change to reflect that. The, what were f originally five regional offices in Part 790 of our regulations, there are now three. The Office of Small Credit Union Initiatives has been changed to CURE, and the language there updated to reflect CURE's mission. And CURE, for the, for the record, stands for Credit Union Resources and Expansion. And finally, the rule reflects the creation of the Office of Business Innovation, which was originally within the Office of the Executive Director. There are largely global changes, and with that, I will take any questions that you have at this time. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ben. Thank you for, for doing this. I used to uh, practice as a tax lawyer for a long time, and tax law can be exceedingly tedious, and so we relied upon technical amendments, and they're more important than they may sound because you're reading something and it's a little bit out of whack, and it sort of destroys in your own mind the integrity of the underlying statute or the underlying regulation. Well, if they got this simple thing wrong, then maybe they got some more important stuff wrong. So technical amendments, cleaning it up, polishing it, where it reads well, where it's internally consistent is hugely important. And thank you for doing this, Ben. Mr. Metzger. I have nothing. Thank you. Although, no, actually, I do like it. Um, so what was the determining factor that federally insured was more accurate than federally hyphened insured? Because I would have done, I would have said oh, man. How that long federally have? hyphened yeah. insured was actually, as so I had English would have been the correct one. So how did we come up with that was incorrect now? But you went to public school in Oregon. So uh, I, mean, it's like, I, mean, I don't know, man. I mean, I suppose I can't plead the fifth. Can I? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, federally insured, two separate words, is largely the structure that we use within our regulations. So. The determination was made that, well, federally space insured is used more times than federally hyphened insured, so we might as well make the fewest changes as possible to do a favor to our folks over at the Federal Register. Okay, well, that's good because what you're telling me, it's not a determination of proper form of English, it's more for consistency. Correct. Yes. I used to teach English, and I would have said hyphen insured was the correct one. But we're going to go with federally insured because it is consistent and not upsetting folks at the Federal Register. I do believe that if folks at the Federal <laughs> Register had to go throughout more than a thousand pages of our regulations and put hyphens in there, they may complain a little bit. Thank you for and and, and thanks for playing along. Also, <laughs> I think that when we publish something in the Federal Register, they charge us for it. So yeah. maybe this is you know maybe we save four like or five dollars by taking the hyphen out. Yeah, taking there you go, there you go. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, well, is there a motion? Yes, I move the board approve final rule technical amendments of NCUA's rules and regulations as attached to the board action memorandum. I second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 We'll let the record show it passed two to zero. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Uh, the newest and last item on our agenda today is 2019 Share Insurance Fund Normal Operating Levels. I'm presenting Larry Fazio, Director of Office of Examination Insurance, Julie Casey, Director of Division of Risk Management, and Ralph Monaco, Chief Economist. Welcome, everyone. And I want to note, Mr. Chair, this I think is Mr. Monaco's swan song before us. I think that's right. We're gonna no miss. Singing. We're gonna miss him. Well, I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if he's going. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna exercise some yeah. type of? Uh, yeah, there there has to be some un, unspoken power in this position. Stop that I can Just say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julie and I are honored to be up here <laughs> <laughs> with Ralph's last um, last hurrah at the board table. Well, good morning, Chairman McWaters, Board Member Metzger, Chief Economist Ralph Monaco, um, 
Director of Risk Management Julie Case and I are here to recommend the board decrease the normal operating level, no hyphens, from 1.39 to 1.38 percent, effective December 13th, 2018. It's important to note our analysis uses June 30th, 2018 and September 30th, 2018 data to generate a point in time estimate based on the best available information at this time. Economic conditions that involve greater volatility in one or more market indicators uh, as compared to the stress scenario model can, of course, lead to different outcomes. The normal operating level represents the point at which excess equity is returned to credit unions in the form of a share insurance fund distribution. So there are a few important things to note regarding NCUA's normal operating level. First, Congress set a floor for the normal operating level in the Federal Crane Act at 1.20%, so it can't be lower than that. Uh, if the equity ratio were to fall below 1.20%, the Act also mandates that the board either assess a premium or develop a fund restoration plan to get it back above 1.20%. Uh, Congress also set a ceiling for the normal operating level of 1.50%. Um, and finally, I'd note that the NCUA board may not assess a premium if the equity ratio exceeds 1.30%. Therefore, even though the equity ratio could go as high as 1.50%, it can only grow above 1.30% through earnings, not premiums. Uh, historically, the board has set the normal operating level as the target equity ratio for, for the fund. The normal operating level was last set at 1.39% in September 2017, based on the new methodology the board adopted at that board meeting as well. So in its role as steward of the share insurance fund, the NCUA must consider its obligation to protect insured member deposits, um, the responsibility that comes with being backed by the full faith and credit in the United, of the United States, and how management of the share insurance fund affects the credit union community. These are the overarching considerations uh, when setting the normal operating level. And to achieve these objectives, the NCUA seeks to ensure the fund can at least withstand a moderate recession without the equity ratio falling below 1.20%. As we previously noted, that's the statutory minimum where the board would have to do a premium or a restoration plan. And though Congress gave the NCUA board the ability to develop a fund restoration plan in lieu of a premium, for extraordinary circumstances, the fund should be able to manage a reasonable range of expected and unexpected declines in the equity ratio without having to rely on a fund restoration plan. Relying on a fund restoration plan uh, could erode public confidence in federal share insurance and would not necessarily eliminate the need for cranes to pay premiums when they can least afford it. So the NCUA should increase the equity of the fund during times of economic prosperity and allow it to decrease so as not to assess premiums during economic downturns. So managing the fund uh, to withstand a moderate recession covers a relatively broad range of outcomes, but there are a number of economic scenarios that could have a greater impact on the fund uh, that do not rise to the level of a severe global recession, so we need to keep that in mind. And I'll turn it over to Julie to discuss the NCUA's policy for setting the normal operating level. Thanks, Larry. In September 2017, the assets and liabilities of the Stabilization Fund were transferred to the Share Insurance Fund. The Board approved setting the normal operating level at 1.39%, recognizing the remaining corporate system resolution program obligations would create additional risk for the Share Insurance Fund until the end of the NGN program in 2021, in addition to the customary risk of insuring federally insured credit unions. Using economic scenarios developed by the Federal Reserve as part of their work on the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review, we modeled the impact on the equity ratio over five years under a moderate recession. For share insurance fund performance, we looked at the three primary drivers, insurance losses, insured share growth, and yield on investments. We also modeled the share insurance fund's claims on the asset management estates under these scenarios. Thus, the methodology for setting the normal operating level also helps ensure the share insurance fund holds enough equity to cover the risk posed by the NGN program. This includes the risk of a decline in the funds receivable for a claim on the corresponding corporate asset management estates in a moderate recession and the anticipated decline in the equity ratio through the end of 2019, even without a recession. 
This is necessary to ensure the equity is available to cover any decline in the value of the claims due to a moderate recession that would occur before the NGNs mature and the underlying assets are sold. As summarized on this slide, in a moderate recession, the equity ratio would decline by 13 basis points from its customary exposures and another two basis points from a reduction in the value of the claims on the corporate estates. In addition, the equity ratio of the fund is expected to decline by three basis points through the end of 2019, even with no economic stress. Given the proposed goal of withstanding a moderate recession without the equity ratio falling below 1.20, the recommended normal operating level is 1.38. The estimated reduction in the value of the claims on the corporate estates has declined from four to two basis points. The risk posed by the NGN program and underlying legacy assets is lower now due to the post-securitized legacy asset sales and amortization of the remaining legacy assets within the NGNs. The projected decline in the equity ratio through the end of 2019, even with no economic stress, has increased from two to three basis points. This is primarily due to lower projected investment income given a reduction in the size of the fund's investment portfolio and an increase in the five-year average for insurance losses due to elevated losses experienced in 2018. By way of reminder, changing the normal operating level has no effect on the claims against the corporate credit union asset management estates of depleted capital investors. The recovery for depleted capital holders operates on a different basis than any return of assessments. Depleted capital holders are not projected to receive any recoveries until at least 2021. It is important to keep in mind that these are projections. Actual results may vary based on things like extraordinary losses and or failures in credit unions, abnormally high insured share growth, or volatile economic conditions. Larry will now discuss our recommended action and what is to expect next. I'm actually going to turn it over to Ralph so he can finish us out here. <laughs> this is when the swan starts to sing. <laughs> <laughs> so at this time, we request the board approve decreasing the normal operating level from 1.39 to 1.38 percent, effective December 13th, 2018. The December 31st, 2018 equity ratio is important because it is part of the statutory basis for determining whether a distribution is made to insured credit unions. There are several pieces of information necessary to calculating the equity ratio. This includes the results of the share insurance funds operations, which will be available in mid-February 2019 when the share insurance funds audited financial statement becomes available. Based on year-end call report data, the NCUA will validate insured shares data by the end of February 2019. Once calculated, the equity ratio is compared to the normal operating level. Should the equity ratio fall below the normal operating level, no distribution will be made and no premium may be charged unless the equity ratio falls below 1.30%. When the equity ratio exceeds the normal operating level and all other regulatory requirements are met, the share insurance fund must pay a distribution. Any distribution will come down to the extent to which the equity ratio exceeds the normal operating level at calendar year end. If there is a distribution, it will occur by the end of the second quarter of 2019. We'd be happy to answer, Larry would be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Just, just. Larry, let, let me, I have a couple of questions before we get into that. Why was it that this we were not able to post this earlier onto the agenda for the board meeting? So we um, the math here is obviously extensive and um, the vetting that goes into the numbers. And so staff completed our work uh, literally last week. Uh, we did not then uh, we weren't able to finish briefing the board members until this week and to finish drafting the the board action materials until yesterday. So that's why it was added um, okay. yesterday. Or, okay. Or this yeah. Morning. That that makes that makes sense to me. Uh, last year, when we raised the normal operating level to one point three nine, we made a commitment uh, that we would look at this every year. And I think some people looked at that, sort of rolled their eyes and said, yeah, sure you will. Well, actually, we, we, we did, and we will continue to do that. So when we took a look at it this year, there were actually some changes that, um, well, on one of the slides, if you could bring those back up. Slide five. 
Slide, yeah, slide five. There you go. There actually were some changes and that the effect on the share insurance fund with respect to a moderate recession, not an adverse, not a 2008-2009 recession, but a moderate recession, stayed the same. But the contingent liabilities and the NGN portfolio, those assets that were moved over to the share insurance fund when we merged the two together, decrease, but the projected equity ratio um, decline in 18 and 19 actually went up just a, just a smidgen, and that lowered the normal operating level to 1.38. So um, we kept our commitment. It's 1.38. I'm not sure what it'll be a year from now. We'll just have to see um, and, and test it then. Uh, I don't really have any other questions. I think the, the document speaks for itself. But before I turn this over to Rick, let me say something about um, our soon-to-be former chief economist, um, Ralph Monaco. When I, when I became chair of the NCUA, one of, one of the jobs, and Mr. Metzger had this job before I did, was to serve on something called the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which was set up by Dodd-Frank. And um, it's a pretty heady group. It's chaired by the Secretary of the Treasury, Vice Chair is the, um, the um, Chair of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And there's a list of um, luminaries as members, including the FDIC Chair, the SEC Chair, and the NCUA Chair. In doing that, we are charged not only with safety and soundness of the financial systems, the ultimate top-tier regulator, if you will, but we're also um, um, burdened, I guess, with responsibility for the financial stability of the United States of America. So in, in doing this, I had the good fortune to start working on a fairly regular basis with, um, with Ralph. And, you know, a, as a lawyer for many, 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 many years, I would, would always look at lawyers, and I've said this before, and some of you may have heard it, that I would look at lawyers as a really, really, really great lawyer can take something that's complex and make it simple. The people think the other way around. You know, they're like a bunch of razzmatazz and a bunch of fancy talk out of a lawyer and a long document. No, no, no. Those are the bad lawyers. The good lawyers, they can take complexity and distill it down to its essence. Well, the same thing applies to economists. Economists are dealing with wildly complex matters. We're dealing with the financial stability of the entire country. So me, not being an economist, I can't make it up. I can't fake that, right? I mean, if I, if I did, it's not in the best interest of the taxpayers of this country. So I rely upon Ralph. So what kind of economist is Ralph? Ralph is the kind of guy that can take exceedingly complex stuff and make it understandable to a guy like me. Now, that's pretty remarkable, and he would do it week in, week out, every board meeting, every briefing, and the like. So, Ralph, I really, really, really do appreciate it. I can't imagine what kind of job I would have done on FSOC without you and without your analysis and your common sense approach to issues where people tend to get off center and you always would bring things back to where they needed to be. Ralph also took a leading role in the deputies um, meetings and um, I would occasionally get calls from people at FSOC and they say, hey, you know, Ralph was saying this at the, the meeting. What do you think about that? Oh, I agree with Ralph. Ralph's spot on. <laughs> You know, and um, they would say, okay, yeah, I'll be happy to talk to the secretary about that. You know, me, so um, thank you, Ralph. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Metzger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, Ralph, thank you again, as uh, Mark has mentioned, for all your great work. And uh, uh, we will miss you. We hope you come back and visit once in a while. Uh, and say hello because sure. uh, it has been uh, just a, a real pleasure working with you. Uh, uh, just a couple of things on the uh, NOL um, to emphasize what the chair has said. Actually, this is the first time in my five plus years on the board that we've actually added something literally on the morning of the board meeting. And I think that um, really is a testament 
of good things. And like, because we know how important something like this is at the end of the year, and that's the determining factor uh, for the, whether there would ever be a dividend at all. Um, and uh, I appreciate the briefing that we had, I think, Tuesday afternoon. Um, and, you know, it would have been easy just to say, well, no, it's too late. Let's not do this. You know, wait till January. But then you lose that opportunity for a whole year, which is not in the best interest of credit unions. So the fact that we were able to bring this forward in a timely manner, I think, is a, a real testament to, as the chairman mentioned, our promise a year ago when we set the normal oper operating level at uh, 1.39 that it was not permanent. We didn't know it could go either way, but it was not permanent, that we were going to reassess it every year. And when and if we saw changes in that that were data driven, you know, uh, objective, um, not subjective, uh, that we would take the appropriate step. And so um, the fact that that data now has been put together to reflect that we can make that change, I think, is, um, again, as the chairman mentioned, you know, fulfillment of our promise that we will continue to look at this and adjust that appropriately. Um, I want to reemphasize what Ralph said, and because if you're a credit and you're thinking, oh, that could mean dividend, that could mean dividend next year. Um, and just a reminder that that is possibly true. Uh, we'll, it will be, again, data driven by what things are at the end of the year. Those numbers will be crunched, uh, but at least it does open that window uh, to a potentiality that we'll know in a few months. Uh, but I want to thank all the staff for working hard to get this to us in time before the end of the year uh, so we can make a decision to move forward. Uh, and again, uh, keeping the promise that we made to continually review uh, this item, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I concur. Um, is there a motion? Yes. I move the board approve decreasing the normal operating level from 1.39 to 1.38 percent as detailed in the board action memorandum. Second that motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Let the record show the motion passed two to zero. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And that's the end of our agenda Ralph. today. There being no further business, we are hereby adjourned. Thanks.